Ever since the dawn of media creation, consumers have always asked questions on the meanings behind specific artifacts. Some of these questions include, what are the messages being sent? What are the artist's motives? Why is this piece of media being created? Commonly, it has been the application process of narratology that allows scholars to critically analyze an artifact's narrative and draw conclusions in meaning of the select piece of work. However, video games present a very interesting point of contention. Video games are much more interactive than books or television. When you watch a movie, the plot, the setting, and the character's agency and goals all stay the same every viewing, so it may be fair to say that the conjured meaning of these artifacts stays static. Video games, however, operate differently because of their interactability and variety. For example, while playing a game of Super Mario Bros, the goal of the player character is to always save the princess. However, the actions taken by the player character differ from player to player in every attempt to save the princess. This can create a different narrative and a different experience for different players. So, in order to critically analyze a video game in a similar way as books, television shows, and films, it may not be entirely fair to apply narratology to video games as this approach neglects to take into account the many additional features such as interactivity and variety that video games bring to the table. This is where ludology comes in. Ludology, in the most general sense, is game studies or the study of games. Scholars using this methodology seek to understand the design of the game, the player's role in the game, and the role the game plays in its cultural society and how each of these factors work together to create meaning. The concern of this methodology does not necessarily derive its meaning from the narrative of the video game, but rather aims to understand the design of the game, the mechanics, the characters, the objectives, the players of the game, who plays, how many, and the game's role in its culture or society. Combining these elements together provide a much better critical analysis for video games than narratology can offer. By applying some common tenets of ludology to recent video games, this should offer an easier understanding of this methodology, as well as underlying the importance of ludology in video game studies. From Software's Dark Souls series has become wildly popular since its first game, Demon Souls, was released on the PlayStation 3 in 2009. What makes Dark Souls ludologically significant is the way that the game seamlessly blends its narrative with its mechanics. The DLC edition of Dark Souls was marketed as the Prepare to Die edition, and for good reason. These games are hard. Like, really hard. Dark Souls' core mechanics are character movement, attacking, running, tumbling, casting spells, and dying. Throughout the course of the game, the average player can expect to die hundreds of times. While the common enemies of most games pose no real threat to the player character, a single mispress in the Dark Souls series can easily end in death. What's worse, death causes the player to drop all of the souls that they have collected by defeating enemies and looting treasure. These souls, which are used to buy weapons and to level up, can be retrieved if the player returns to the spot of their previous death. However, all the enemies the player defeated will also respawn, and if the player dies again on the way back to retrieve their souls, then all of the souls are destroyed and the player leaves a new marker on the ground at the point of their most recent death. What makes this retrieval system so compelling is the narrative rationale in which this mechanic operates. In the game world of Dark Souls, everyone is already dead. The player and their human enemies are all cursed with the Dark Sign, an inability to attain a true, natural state of death. Undead and doomed to wander in search of mortality, the player character's constant cycle of life and death perfectly exemplifies the way that narrative functions within all video games. Regardless of whether player death is acknowledged within the context of the game world, the ludonarratological structure of the game implicitly includes all actions taken by the player character, even those which necessarily disrupt the narrative of the game's story. This often leads to the development of a second layer of narrative, the idealized narrative which the game presents, and the practical narrative of how the game itself actually unfolds. For example, in The Legend of Zelda games, the story that the game presents does not allow for the death of the game's hero, Link. When Link does die, the game is over, and the player starts again at a convenient location as though Link's death had never occurred. But from a ludological standpoint, Link's death is a real aspect of the narrative which the game creates. 
The seemingly unaccounted for dead ends that arise upon character death can create a contradiction between the story that the game thinks it's telling and the narrative which the game is actually creating. What if the game's character is Link, Mario, or Halo's Master Chief, the vast majority of video games never account for or acknowledge this basic tension. It's part of the reason why Dark Souls is such an engrossing experience. By acknowledging player character death within its own internal story, Dark Souls eliminates the tension between idealized and practical narratives by telling a story and creating a game world with no room for contradictions. While narrative plot is an important aspect in gaming, a lack of narrative can also be used to create a game. Padilla is an idea of having a game with no winning plot. Padilla games have no set goals. Instead, players are free to explore and create their own goals. Mojang's sandbox game, Minecraft, has become one of the top-selling games of all times with its simplistic art style and gameplay. This one-of-a-kind game allows players to build and interact with the 3D textured blocks that make up their randomly generated worlds. Minecraft ex or exhibits the use of Padilla because the game itself has no way of winning. Minecraft has two modes of play available, survival and creative. In survival mode, players can freely create what they want, but the tools and texture blocks to create them must be discovered or crafted. Upon nightfall, monsters, referred to as the mob, can attack the player while they build and explore. Players have the choice of hiding within a shelter until the sun comes up, or to fight the mob with the weapons they have created. In more recent updates, they have given the player the ability to create optional achievements or to battle an ender dragon, but these are not required by the player to complete. However, if a player knowingly pursues these optional goals, the game then becomes Ludus. The other playable mode in Minecraft is the creative mode. In creative mode, players can spawn any block or item of their choosing, and are given the ability of flight and immortality. With these new abilities, the player is able to create whatever they want. With no way of dying and no goals to achieve, Minecraft creative mode becomes a giant canvas for the player to create. Mods allow the creativity to grow within the game by adding new skins and textures to the Minecraft environment, from adding shadows and reflections to styling the entire world to look like Tron. While some may build small homes and villages within the creative mode, some players have took it upon themselves to create large-scale replicas within the Minecraft world of things such as the Starship Enterprise from Star Trek, Winterfeld Castle from the Game of Thrones series, and even Grand Theft Auto V's Los Santos in its entirety. With other tools available in Minecraft, such as levers, buttons, and redstone, players have the ability to create functioning graphing calculators, as well as a one kilobyte hard drive uh, within the game. By allowing uh, complete freedom to players in the game and not restricting them with rules, players are able to play a game without having to move along with a narrative story to reach an end. We hope by explaining and applying the concepts of ludology to several video game examples provides a better understanding of this methodology. It is important that ludology continues to become more widespread and more well known as video games become more robust in the future. By examining video games under the lens of ludology, we can achieve a more insightful and significant understanding of video games themselves. Thank you for watching.